Lindsay, and thanks to you for joining us for today's webinar on Building High-Value Care Bridges, brought to you by the AHA's Physician Leadership Forum. I'm really pleased today to have uh, Dr. Christopher Moriades, Assistant Dean for Healthcare Value and Associate Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin, joining us. Uh, Dr. Moriades speaks internationally on topics related to educating clinicians about healthcare value and how to implement high-value care programs. So without any further introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Moriades to tell you all about it. Dr. Moriades, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you to the AHA, and appreciate spending uh, this hour of our afternoon all together with you guys. Um, so what we're going to talk about is building high-value care bridges between the educational and clinical environments. Um, first, some disclosures. I do get royalties from McGraw-Hill um, for the textbook Understand Value-Based Healthcare, and a lot of the work that I'll be sharing today has been supported by grants from the ABM Foundation, the Macy Foundation, Episcopal Health Foundation, and ACGME. Uh, <clears throat> so a little more than a year ago, I was sitting in my office in San Francisco. I worked at UCSF as a hospitalist um, where I had trained, and I felt like I had the best job in the world. I had a, a great boss named Bob Wachter, who many of you may know. Um, we were starting to do a lot of work in value improvement um, and uh, getting more traction in that. And I got a phone call from Clay Johnston, who had been at UCSF but had moved to Austin, Texas to become the dean of a new, not even existent yet, medical school called Dell Medical School at UT Austin. Um, and he asked if I would consider coming to check it out. And having grown up in California my whole life, the, the prospect of moving to Texas didn't sound like something that I was uh, particularly interested in, but I, I thought I would come see what was going on and came down to Austin. and. Um, learned a lot of things during that visit that was really compelling. And the first was that the people of Travis County, where Austin is, had voted to raise their own property taxes to help support the medical school and to help support creating a healthy city in Austin. And so Dean Johnston said to me, you know, the people of Austin have really committed in us, the, our community is committed, and so we're committed to them. And how we're going to measure success is extremely clear. We have to provide health to the people in our city um, and create this a model healthy city. And as I walked around with him and literally the buildings being raised from the ground, the medical school, new hospital, the clinic buildings, the health discovery building, um, we started to talk about the opportunity to really build value in from the foundation of this medical school in both the clinical and the educational enterprise and to create a role um, that uh, would be responsible for doing that. And so we um, talked about the opportunity to create a role uh, and a title um, that I ended up taking, which was an assistant dean for healthcare value. And um, you know, when you make up a title, you get to be the first in the country of that. So I'm the first assistant dean for healthcare value, but I hope not to be the only. And what I hope to do today is to really talk about the importance of um, connecting, bridging both education and clinical value improvement activities. I imagine that those of you on the call, some of you find yourself more on the educational side of the house, some of you more within, and probably more of you within clinical operations. Um, and that's fine, and, and maybe you'll find more of the tools in the first half or the second half of my talk today more specifically valuable to you. But I hope no matter what to leave you with the sense that um, these need to happen together, um, that if we're going to make progress in value, we need to really think about how we are coordinating and bridging and implementing across both education and uh, and uh, clinical operations. And the reason I tell you my story is just because I think it's really illustrative. It's the story of getting a trainee involved. So when I had done my training at UCSF and I was a resident, as I mentioned, I worked with uh, the smartest people in the world. Um, and I thought I could ask them anything um, and they would know the answer. But there was one question. When I would ask anybody within the hospital, how much does that cost? How much is that going to cost our patient? How much, is that, how much does that cost our hospital? I always got the same response, no matter who it was. And it was clear that nobody seemed to know. 
Um, and this was 2010, and uh, at that time, Molly Cook, also at UCSF, had written a piece in the New England Journal about medical education's responsibility to start thinking about cost awareness. And thankfully, because of the environment I was in, I was able to um, work with mentors and, and learn how to start to address this. And we started by um, implementing a cost awareness program at our hospital where we just started teaching about cost and started asking questions. And we started a noon conference. And that grew to then um, help contribute material to the ACP's National High Value Care Curriculum that's now freely available. And then as I started to graduate residency and went to take my faculty job, um, I remember Bob Wachter told me, you know, you're a resident leader, that's great, but it's kind of like being a childhood actor. It doesn't mean you'll make it in the real world. Um, what are you going to do? You know, you can't just talk or teach about value. You need to do something about it. And that's what I think we should talk about today, is what are we going to do about it? How are we going to connect and bridge education and clinical value improvement? Um, so, first off, I, I think just to get this out of the way, um, there are many different definitions thrown out there, all kinds of equations. And when I'm talking about value today, I'm going to use the simple definition that value-based healthcare is, is uh, considering outcomes that matter to patients um, over total cost of care. So what are the outcomes that we achieve that matter to patients um, with consideration of how much does that cost? So now I'd like to do a quick poll for those of you on the call. I'm, I'm curious, um, how many of you uh, have a educational or clinical program um, focused on value currently within your medical center, within your medical school? So you should see here on the screen, um, and you can click the buttons, yes or no. Do you have an education or clinical program focused on value? I'll give a few minutes here. Wow, um, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of no's come in, which I'm going to interpret that as you're here on the phone to, to learn how to do this, I hope, um, or to find out about tools that you can implement locally. Um, certainly, we know there are many barriers to this, um, to implementing value both educationally and clinically. Um, but I, I think that, uh, and, and by evidence of you being here, I think it's becoming widely recognized um, that this is a critical component of uh, how we're going to deliver care, particularly in hospitals. Um, and those in hospital administration and hospitalists have a key role to play um, in all of our local environments, but nationally in advancing the goals of providing value to, to patients. So um, thank you to the about half of you on the call that have responded um, to that poll. Uh, and so what I would like to do is share first the argument for, and I'll do this briefly, um, but the argument for why we must integrate this into education. And then I'll share a number of tools and models um, that we've developed uh, on the education side of the house and, and then on the clinical operations to combine these two. And the first is there's a lot of evidence. I've got, you know, just a few of the references listed here. But the environments in which medical trainees learn have lifelong effects on their medical practices. Um, that uh, those uh, trainees who are do their residency in um, intensive settings where they're taught where the environment is to order lots and lots of things, um, if you follow them out into their careers, that practice tends to stick with them. And so what we teach and what we show and what we model um, has lasting effects, uh, both in quality and in uh, value and resource utilization. And we need to start upstream. So although many folks are starting to recognize the need to teach about value at, say, the clinical level, to start teaching our physicians about the concepts of value and, and the definition and how we address it, um, and many as well recognize that we should be doing this in residency training, and there's been some tools that have come out. I've mentioned the ACP curriculum um, for residents. Uh, I really would argue that we need to look all the way upstream. We need to introduce this into the very way that we teach uh, healthcare professionals about their job. And I would argue when you teach a first-year medical student about value, it's not about 
specific things. You know, certainly it's not about teaching them macro or policy that's going to potentially change by the time they are in practice, but rather it's about giving them an entire perspective. Um, you know, when you, when you take that red pill of learning about value and seeing the world in how are we improving outcomes for patients over total cost of care, I believe it really shifts the way you view everything you learn. Um, and so in first year med school, when you're learning about chest pain and how to work it up, if you've been introduced to value, you think very differently when you see all those lists of potential stress tests that you can get. You ask different types of questions. And we need to start upstream to do that. Um, now, like I said, I know many of you are in clinical operational roles, and the argument that I hear often is, well, fine, but we have a problem now, and if I'm teaching a first-year med student, that's not going to really show effects for you know, 10 years, 15 years, and that's absolutely true. Uh, so I don't think it means that we don't do anything currently, but we need to recognize that unless we really get in upstream and have the ripple effects from trainees' learning experiences, uh, we're not going to have the sustainable change that we really want to see. If you get to a medical student, those students' learning will reach all corners of our healthcare system. Um, when I hear the criticism about that this is the long game, I, I, I like to think about the uh, old proverb many of you have probably heard, which is, you know, when is the best time to have planted a tree um, 20 years ago? Uh, when's the second best time today? Um, and I think we're facing that right now. Sure, it would have been great if we had done this a long time ago, but now we really need to, to address this uh, need. And we know that this is clearly a gap. I, there are many examples of this that medical training programs lack, and you guys just showed us, um, lack formal and informal mechanisms for training health professionals. Um, and the Institute of Medicine, MedPAC, have all identified it as a critical need within healthcare training um, to think about uh, value and how we're providing outcomes and considering costs. So we need to bridge that gap. Uh, we're the ones who need to bridge what we're talking about in the educational enterprise, what we're recognizing as a need, and what we're actually doing in our clinical environments. And so this is the argument, I believe, for creating bridging leaders and bridging leadership roles that are specifically responsible for bridging this gap, for understanding what's happening in the clinical environment and also um, understanding uh, what we're teaching uh, and, and making that more continuous. And so what I'm going to do is look at two pieces, two sides of this bridge. The first is to talk about a robust value-based healthcare curriculum for all that, that we have built and um, options available for everybody to use, and then shift focus into how you create those value improvement initiatives within the clinical learning environments. So we just released in June this year, Discovering Value-Based Healthcare. Um, they're interactive learning modules, and I know online modules is, is, can be a dirty word. Um, we uh, got a million dollar grant from the Episcopal Health Foundation to build out this program. And so we spent a lot of time and money and worked with um, an Institute for Transformational Learning um, to think about how we make this so it's not like traffic school. Um, so it's not like those things that people just have to uh, muddle through, but rather is interactive, engaging. Um, and so we're creating, so far we've got on slate 10 uh, complete modules that will uh, cover the gamut of what we believe every health professional should know about healthcare value. But currently we've released the first um, the first collection. And that collection we call Introduction to Healthcare Value. It's composed of three modules. Um, each take about 45 minutes to complete. It's available completely free of charge. And in fact, we now offer free CME credit for anybody who completes the three modules. And we also offer a free certificate um, from Dell Med School for completing the Introduction to Value-Based Healthcare. And what we've done with these modules is we've thought, if we're going to give a free introduction to folks, we want it to be what does every health professional need to know, whether you're a first-year medical student or a practicing physician, um, what is it that you need to understand? And in order to do that, we've created a, a few um, critical components. The first is that we start every module with a clinical vignette. So we, we've created these videos. Um, and it's particularly important, we find, uh, for young trainees who perhaps don't totally know the system yet to see where the gaps are. So in that first module, we have a, a vignette showing a uh, 
a standard you know case of somebody who it, it, it really illustrates the lack of coordination of their care, the duplication of tests, um, the confusing uh, communication um, from the health uh, from her physicians, um, and so you watch these vignettes, and it helps ground it into our day-to-day -day clinical lives. Um, and then what we do is we actually create a dialogue. So after watching the video, we ask folks to respond and tell us what problems they saw, and then we collect those and we show them. So after you submit your response, you get to see the responses of others from across the country, and we believe this helps create a community of learners. So you can see others are doing this with you, um, as well as create a sense of accountability, right? Because you know you, you can't just type gibberish or you're, it's going to show up with your name next to it. Um, and so we, we thought about how do you create this community um, we also have the modules interactive, so you can go, you can click on graphs, and it will show you some specific examples. We'll link out to different uh, topics, um, and we have exercises that, uh, that the learners can do. In each of the modules, um, we have a care redesign case. These are loosely based on the idea of the Harvard Business School um, cases where you look at an institution that's implemented something, give a background on it. So in this first one, we looked at University of Utah and really focused on their value-driven outcome tool, explained what it was, provide um, supplementary resources for those who want to dig deeper. And then after the care redesign case, we do an exercise, the learners do an exercise to help illustrate uh, an aspect of what we learned. So from the value-driven outcome tool, we've created a mock value-driven outcome tool that looks much like the one at University of Utah, um, using real data actually from Texas. Um, and we walk the learners through an exercise to make sure that they understand how to use it. Um, and so they go through, they see how to identify opportunities um, on the, the scale of, a, of an entire uh, health system. And then we zoom in to look at actual patient level data, um, and we provide patient stories for each of these to really tie it back and show here's the opportunity we have to tie hospital operations to your day-to-day -day work and how you can identify gaps and how some of the, this variation um, is warrant, warranted. So, you know, this middle-cost patient had warranted reasons for their variation, but others are really due to systemic issues or just due to individual clinician issues. In another example, in the third module, um, so maybe I should mention, so module one really provides an overview. Module two gets into measuring what matters and describes outcome measures versus process measures, talks about patient reported outcome measures, explains the importance of that. Um, the case is about uh, UNOS and how they completely redesigned their outcome measures um, and, and the results they've achieved from that. Um, and then the third module is about um, understanding costs in healthcare. And we get into charge masters versus cost versus price. Um, we get into different accounting methods, so time-driven activity-based costing. Um, and we, we give a um, care redesign case of MD Anderson, and we talk about how they implemented TDABC within their clinics and some of the results they got. The activity we provide after that is a description, if you kind of see here, I know it's small, but a clinical case where each time you click on one of the um, blue areas, one of the services that we provide, it adds up on the side like an Amazon shopping cart. And so the learner can see how each of these things add up. And we then provide the opportunity to see, well, what if Ms. Chen has insurance A? What does that mean for her out-of-pocket costs? What if she has insurance B? What if she's uninsured? And then we provide a TDABC next to the whole thing that shows, well, what if they, they did real cost accounting, not using charge master prices, but figured out how much this actually costs. And so I think it's a pretty cool um, way to really teach folks and get them to experience these lessons of why um, costs matter in healthcare, what do the different terms mean, how can we think of more rational cost accounting, um, and also how does it affect the patient in front of us. Um, and don't abstract this just to a GDP level or a national level that oftentimes does not capture the hearts and minds of those of us who put on white coats and see patients most days. So. Um, this, uh, as I mentioned, is available for free. It's here on this website. You just register so that we can uh, give people credit um, and track. And we had, actually, the, the first month we had um, more than 250 people outside of Del Med, so um, nationally that had accessed the, uh, actually registered and, and went through the curriculum. Um, and we've had folks like uh, Hopkins has a High Value Practice Academic Alliance, um, which is a national program. They have 82 residents and fellows from across the country that are 
there in their future leader program. Um, and they've uh, implemented this as a mandatory curriculum now, so they'll be going through it as well. My hope, and I share it, um, we, we are proud of it, but I share it because, you know, 80% of you or so said you don't have anything there, and here's an off-the-shelf curriculum that really can be used at any level, can be asynchronous. You don't even need a local faculty champion. It can be self-directed, um, and, uh, and we have more to come after this. And in fact, we've been in talk with um, the American Hospital Association on collaborating on some of these future modules and really making sure that we have some that focus on um, the hospital continuum of care and how we implement value in that, um, how we think about uh, rural and, and critical access hospitals and their role in this. So um, those of you that, are, that would be interested in, in one day collaborating on that or, or sharing some of your stories as one of the care redesign cases, um, I would love to, to speak to you and think about how we could do that. One more off-the-shelf resource that I want to share that um, I've also been engaged with is uh, we have a national nonprofit called Cost of Care um, that's been around for a bunch of years um, developing resources for clinicians around uh, affordability in healthcare. And so we've created some um, video modules um, about how you have conversations about value. So we have four modules. These are also free and available for CME credit. Um, and they're available on our website. They're, they're actually um, administered through the doctor's channel, which provides CME credit. Um, and they cover how you have conversations with patients, um, how you talk about medication costs, uh, particularly for those of you in hospitals, I think the bottom two are um, particularly relevant. One talks about teamwork, how you have conversations between nurses and physicians and patients um, that relate to value and overuse. And then the last one, how you have conversations with supervisors and consultants. So um, shows a trainee um, talking to a neurosurgery fellow and then talking to her attending um, and tries to highlight uh, how we can have these conversations and teach very specific skills around this. Um, they all, each of them feature choosing wisely recommendations. So the teamwork one specifically has choosing wisely recommendations for um, hospitalists from SHM and from the American Academy of Nursing. We need to bridge, however, from what they have learned. So we need to get this out of just online modules and, and lectures and courses into what trainees and what our clinicians actually do. And so something we've implemented here um, had been developed by Eileen Moser at UPenn and a group at ACP um, is called SOAP V. Um, and what it is is a tool to help guide oral presentations, to build value into a cognitive forcing function um, for medical students and trainees. And the idea is when a medical student is presenting, or really any uh, clinician, here we've expanded it from our medical students to our uh, residents um, and have been talking to our hospitalists about this as well, that when you present a general SOAP presentation, you end with a value component where you essentially ask yourself three things. Will this change management and does it incorporate evidence? Have I considered the patient's goals? And what is the cost actual relative of the tester treatment? And by, by having that be a part of the standard note, um, students have an opportunity to put this into practice, to think about areas of overuse. It, it forces them to recognize issues like Foley catheters that could have or should have come out, um, transfusions that perhaps are, are not warranted, daily labs that were ordered, you know, on admission, QAM for forever. Um, and so what we've seen is by opening up those conversations, medical students actually are managing up because they're bringing up these topics on their team um, to others, and it's a very simple model. What we did, by the way, at Del Med was we've implemented this into not just medicine, but all of our core clerkships, and we created pocket cards with this SOAP V model that we gave to all of our uh, trainees um, and our hospitalist attendings um, to see, to remind them of what are the components uh, to ask themselves for value. And as we try to activate um, and move upstream, another opportunity to do that is a program we're launching called Choosing Wisely Stars. This is based on a really successful model that was done in Canada. Um, so Choosing Wisely Canada started STARS about two years ago. And what they did in Canada was they got two medical students from each of the 17 med schools. In Canada, it's pretty easy. I guess there's only 17 med schools in the whole country. Um, so they get two students from each of those schools, bring them uh, 
to they brought them to Toronto that first year and did a summit where they taught them about leadership, they taught them about choosing wisely, um, and a couple other topics, and then sent them off back to their med schools, having created a learning collaborative. Um, so they support them throughout the year, and those students implemented programs within their schools. So some started choosing wisely journal clubs, others started interest groups, others met with their curriculum planning committee and figured out how to get this integrated into their first year curriculum. Um, and it, it was pretty amazing what the students had done that first year. And so we've decided to replicate that model here. Um, and so we've achieved, we've um, got grant funding from Macy Foundation, the ABM Foundation, support from Dell Med, Choosing Wise of Canada, and Cost of Care. And we'll be having our leadership summit for medical students here in Austin on December 2nd. Um, our plan is to take two med students from each of 20 medical schools across the U.S. And right now, we're actually collecting interested medical schools. We, we have a group of about 20, but there's still time. If, you, if anybody um, on the call wants to throw their hat in the ring, you should contact me and let me know your school is interested. Um, and we want to select 20 schools that are diverse. Um, to have their medical students come, and we're, we're, uh, we have the funding to pay for those students um, to come and join us. And so they will get education. We'll plug them into a learning collaborative. Um, we'll have monthly webinars like this, um, teaching them about examples around the country of what folks are doing around choosing wisely and teaching value. Um, and we will follow uh, what they do at their schools. And I think, um, and part of what we're doing is not just getting the students engaged, but also getting um, high level support. So getting a faculty mentor and a dean locally at their schools who say they support these efforts. And this is a way to really implement this um, from the ground up. Uh, to, to make sure that we're spreading this message um, throughout our educational, uh, throughout the country um, educationally. So that hopefully gives you a, a few different opportunities and tools um, that uh, medical schools, trainees, uh, health professional schools can be engaged in. Um, and that you can use uh, no matter what level. So you can use this with your faculty or with your clinicians at your hospital. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about how we're implementing this into learning environments or uh, clinical environments more broadly. Um, and so a program that we're launching, we're calling Bridges to Better Care. It's based on something that we had done successfully at UCSF, and there it's called Caring Wisely. Um, in fact, we actually just had under uh, the leadership of Ralph Gonzalez, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at UCSF, um, just in this month's Journal of Hospital Medicine, um, is an article describing Caring Wisely and the first few years of our program and success. Um, so if you want to read more, that's available in Journal of Hospital Medicine this month. Um, and the idea behind it is fairly simple. We crowdsource ideas from the front line. Um, we get the ideas about how people can improve value within the hospital. The, the concept of this is fairly simple. Many of these are, um, programs in the past have really happened or currently really happened top down, right? We see an opportunity, we say, well, we're going to decrease unnecessary transfusions or we need to decrease surgical supply costs, and then we push out some sort of program. And if you look at UCSF, you know, I ran around on a 15-floor hospital taking care of patients with folks. If you were to take the elevator down, cross Windy Parnassus Avenue, go up in the next elevator to the fifth floor where these beautiful offices with views of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, that's where our administration sat, and that's who made policy. And a lot of times, I mean, they were great, wonderful people, um, but a lot of times there's a disconnect between what's really happening on the 14th floor and the policy that's being written across the street. And so what Bridges to Better Care is meant to do is quite literally bridge that divide. Um, you know, here it's the same. Here our, our administration offices are all the way across town from the hospital that I work at. Um, and so we want to bridge that divide. And what we have found is by crowdsourcing, by asking everybody in the hospital, clerks, medical students, nurses, physicians, researchers, anybody engaged in that health system, tell us your ideas on how you can uh, improve value for patients. Um, we collected so many ideas. We, we got more than 70 ideas in each of the four iterations that we did at UCSF. The first year we had, I think, 150 ideas. Um, and the thing that I want to point out is, Yes, sometimes we get ideas that are really brilliant that we didn't think of. A lot of times the ideas um, 
weren't necessarily something that the administration wouldn't have thought of, but the fact was you got engagement. You got 70 people to, to go on and be engaged in this work. And when the message from the nurse on the orthopedic floor is, I think we can decrease unnecessary blood transfusions, it tends to, it seemed our experience was that it actually um, resonated much better than when that message came from our CMO. Um, and so we, we did projects like that. Um, the other key here is that while we're crowdsourcing ideas, we are, it, we're choosing the ideas based on criteria and based on strategic priorities. So it's not necessarily a crowd voting platform. Um, we match the ideas and enthusiasm from the front lines with the, uh, with the priorities and strategies of the uh, clinical enterprise. And so we create a low barrier to entry. We then pick the best ideas and we invite them to develop a multidisciplinary proposal on how they would implement it. And a lot of what we do is this is iterative. So as the centralized team um, and as the director, I would look at the proposals and help make connections. Like you really need a nurse on your team or let's talk to this person or I'd go to our um, to the person in charge of our EHR and say, hey, is this idea even feasible? So we did a lot of vetting for these ideas. And then we chose um, up to three of them each year to implement. And what was done at UCSF was we gave, uh, the medical center actually gave up to $50,000 funding for each of these projects. And what that money did was it paid for some of the clinician time to help lead it. Um, but this wasn't a grant program. And in fact, in the two years that I helped direct, none of the project, none of the programs actually spent all $50,000, um, and which seems surprising, but really it was because the message was this isn't a grant program, and we provided a lot of the centralized support they needed. We had our own data person who could pull data for them from the EHR. We had our own um, implementation scientists. We did a lot of that centralized work so that the people from the front lines could be the leaders, the champions, um, and could be out front messaging, um, but we helped helped provide the institutional learning and uh, expertise. I want to make this, um, I want to make this uh, concrete. So let's see if I can get this slide to advance. Oh, there we go. Um, so we got trainees involved, and so I want to show what that looked like. Karina Zygarakis is a UCSF neurosurgery resident. She actually just graduated. Um, but she had a great idea. She realized that when she would operate, um, that all of her attendings practiced differently, uh, but they didn't seem to know it. So literally when she was doing spine cases, she noticed that one attending used blue glue and one attending used white glue on their spine cases. Um, and she found that interesting. So she looked into it and the blue glue cost eight times as much and there was no evidence that she could see in the literature nor in their experience to suggest the blue glue was any better. And she thought, this is crazy. Um, and so she had the idea to provide uh, scorecards to show the supply cost to the surgeons. Um, and the reason this works so well, I think, is because here I'm a hospitalist leading this Caring Wisely program, but I'm not dumb enough to go to the neurosurgeon and tell them they're using the wrong glue. Right? That doesn't go over well. But Karina, she's the right messenger for that. She could do that and, um, in a gentle way. As a, as a trainee, she was able to just say, hey, I noticed these differences. I, w I want to provide or help provide some feedback to our whole group. Um, and so Karina was the visible leader and champion. She also had the content expertise. She could look and say whether things are reasonable or not in ways that I couldn't. So if I look at the surgical supplies, I don't know if you know, the, the difference in cost for this type of screw is, is worth it, um, but Karina could. And she, um, now she's a special person, but she was really able to go and get the surgeon buy-in. However, Karina can't lead this program on her own. Um, she, you know, neurosurgery training, right? She was a chief resident and at San Francisco General and working uh, crazy hours. And so what we were able to do was we were able to take that funding and hire some of the time of a project manager. So while Karina was chief resident at the general, there was a project manager continuing to move this program along. We were able to pull the data to verify it, to clean it, um, to go to the OR with Karina and see firsthand what's really happening and make sure that matches with the data we're pulling um, and to design the scorecards. And then with Ralph Gonzalez, our chief innovation officer, we were able to go across the street and um, negotiate a shared savings plan for the surgeons. Not where the surgeons would get money themselves, 
but where if they hit certain metrics, their department would get um, some money back in order to put towards their educational program. Um, so if they saved a certain percent, we would, you know, give them uh, $20,000 back or something into the department. Um, and so we were, we were able to do that. And we published this in JAMA Surgery um, at the end of last year. Uh, and in the first year, we showed more than a million dollars in savings, and this is continuing to grow. And this was really only amongst three intervention groups, um, so only focused on uh, three surgical groups. Um, and there was a significant change between the intervention group and the control group, which continued to have a rise in their in their surgical supply costs. Um, and so I think this is a way that to engage trainees and clinicians in this work rather than simply saying, well, we're going to decrease our surgical supplies. Um, and, you know, you can do that. And there are plenty of places who have done that. Um, in an institution, in an um, educational setting um, like UCSF, like where I work now, um, I don't feel that always goes over so well with the, with the surgeons. Um, and so this was a model that I, I think has worked well, and so we're looking to implement it again here. Um, that article in JHM goes into other examples, such as our blood transfusion work, which similarly has saved um, over $3 million over the first few years um, in uh, decreasing blood transfusions. Another example of engaging trainees um, is an alternative payment model. So a lot of times I hear the thought that, well, that's not really their issue, right? Trainees are kind of held below the fray, I suppose, of these sort of issues. Um, but it can be really powerful when you engage them. And we can see this in many of the orthopedic training programs. So I used to work on medical consult a lot. Um, and on med consult, uh, we kind of had a we had a policy, right? We made recommendations. We didn't write orders, except for the orthopedic patients. We were asked to actually write orders for them. Um, and you know what we'd see is that patients oftentimes were sent to rehab, sent to SNFs, that we could go ahead and order, you know, whatever we wanted. We can get CTs or MRIs with abandon. Um, and then suddenly, uh, we were the our orthopedic department was part of. Um, one of the innovation uh, pilots um, for the bundled payment. And when that happened, the trainees were actually engaged in that and, and taught about it and uh, given feedback. And suddenly, the ask, it was really noticeable how much things changed. All of a sudden, we were being asked on medicine consult to discuss if we were going to order things. You know, we, if we're going to get a CTPE, they wanted us to talk about it and have communication. Um, there was a real shift to, to trying to get patients home rather than to sniff. Um, and you could really see how it affected their, their practice. Um, rather than protecting them, it was a really amazing experiential uh, program for them to learn. And so what we're talking about here is really moving across the spectrum from educating our clinicians at all levels about how to think about value, to think about outcomes that matter for patients, to consider costs of care, and then a activate them um, to act on that, to provide them programs and support um, that allows them to, to uh, implement those ideals um, within the clinical learning environment. The last topic I want, to ta I want to touch upon is the importance of culture. So we all know that uh, culture varies um, from place to place. And if you look at patient safety culture experience over the last few decades, um, we have found that, one, you can define specific domains that create that culture. And two, that the culture varies most between departments within a single place, um, uh, just as much as between different institutions. And as we've started to roll out high-value education and high-value programs, we've recognized that critical to this is what is the local culture like to help support um, those programs. And so taking a page out of the patient safety culture uh, playbook here, um, we sought to create a high-value care culture survey. Reshma Gupta, who was a Robert Wood Johnson scholar at the time, is at UCLA um, and is now helping lead some of the quality and value uh, programs there at UCLA, um, led a group from UCLA and UCSF um, to create this uh, high value care culture survey um, using a uh, using a um, sample from across the country where we um, 
asked experts and created this survey and then verified it um, and have since actually studied it in a number of institutions. We, we have a second paper in press about this where we've shown um, that it does correlate quite well with value-based purchasing scores. Um, and we have found that there are uh, four key domains. It really comes down to leadership and health system messaging, um, which is more than what just the vision or mission statement is to the hospital, but rather what is the real messaging that people are hearing about our commitment to value um, and, uh, and the importance of that. In fact, um, 17 of the items on the final, t on the final survey um, represented that domain because uh, those that we studied, it, it seemed to speak so importantly. Um, also having access to data both um, for value, for quality, uh, safety, and cost aspect, aspects. Having clinicians that are comfortable with cost conversations amongst each other and with patients. And then creating um, a blame-free or a just culture um, environment. And so the survey is um, also available um, and can identify specific areas. And we've used it in hospitals groups and internal medicine residency training programs. There's a website there that if you want to find out more information about that um, survey. And as we create a culture um, and as we think about the connections and bridging between education and clinical environments, the ACGME has really helped um, start to lead some of this work. And so the ACGME has launched um, last year a Pursuing Excellence program where they've uh, selected eight out of the more than 800 institutions um, that they represent uh, to create programs that uh, bridge both educational and clinical sides of the house. And so here at Del Med, we've um, created a campaign we're calling I'm In. So we've created these buttons and stickers, and we're getting everybody in the hospital to say, I'm in. It's, it's kind of like an I voted sticker, um, but just showing their commitment to what we're defining as our four metrics, safety, well-being, experience, and affordability. Um, and the goal is for these eight institutions that are part of this program to pilot ideas like this, to create lessons, and spread them to the 800 um, ACGME accredited uh, programs. And so this is a four-year program. We're just finishing out our first year, um, so I think there will be more to come from this. And I, I'd like to just finish by thinking about um, the importance of our environment, our culture, and implementing this across all aspects. So you all probably, or many of you remember the blockbuster movie, A Few Good Men. And in it, there's a scene, and it, it might not be the exact one you're thinking of, but there's a scene where one of the Marine discusses how he knew about performing code reds to punish his colleagues. And in it, the defense lawyer gets up and asks him, are code reds found in any of the manuals, standard operating procedure reports, or anything else? And of course, they are not. And so he says, is there no book, no manual or pamphlet, no set of ideas or regulations that lets me know that as a Marine, part of my duty is to perform code reds? And the Marine on the stand says, no. The lawyer smugly takes his seat, uh, thinking he proved his point. But then Tom Cruise gets up. <laughs> and Tom Cruise simply asks if the location of the mess hall is in any of the manuals. And it, too, is not. And so he says, how did you know where the mess hall was if it's not in the book? The Marine thinks about it and says, I guess I just followed the crowd at chow time, sir. And so this is the point. So it is with culture. What we do is much more important than anything we write down or define. We all just follow the crowd. We need to teach our ideals. We need to teach about choosing wisely and value. We need to start that as far upstream as, possi as possible. But we have to concentrate on what we actually do and how we create that environment, how we provide programs that allow um, our clinicians to lead and not just respond to value initiatives, um, but lead these programs, um, and how we can think about putting the, the domains in place, um, such as data to access transparency, health care system leadership messaging, um, blame-free environments, uh, and teaching them how to have comfort with cost conversations that can really change the environments we're all working in and teaching in. Um, so with that, I thank you. Um, I thank you for spending your, an hour of your afternoon with me, and I really welcome questions. So please, the, the chat box is here. Um, open up for any questions from the group, and I'd be happy to answer. Um, and also, you can reach me uh, via email um, if you have interest in any of these programs I discussed. Well, while we wait for folks to type in their questions, um, I do have one to start. This is Alyssa. Um, what has the feedback been from physicians who have been through your um, 
various programs, and does it vary by where they are in their careers? So are you getting more enthusiasm maybe from trainees, and um, or is there a difference? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. I, you know, I have to say um, we have found a lot of enthusiasm. This it's changed quite a bit. So um, and it's amazing how quickly it's changed. So when I first started the cost awareness curriculum, um, and you know, this was less than uh, six years ago, seven years ago. It was pretty amazing how it kind of felt. Um, dangerous. <laughs> like people had not been asking these questions and here we were starting to ask questions about cost and you know it's kind of controversial and not everybody was sure we should be talking about it. Um, and since then it's it's become so um, obvious I think in, in at least so many of the circles that, that I find myself in in medical education um, that there's been so much less pushback. Now there's a lot of recognition of the barriers and that changes based on the level. So when you talk to medical students they you know rah-rah around this and they want to carry you out on their shoulders and they're all idealistic and when you get out into the trenches and you talk to those who've been in this for a while you know they bring up all the real barriers and all the past uh, things that have been tried that didn't work for whatever reason. Um, so I do think that there are different perspectives and barriers that come from this. Um, but I, I haven't found, uh, I found decreasing amounts of pushback. And I, you know, I don't know if those of you on the phone have, have felt differently um, when talking to, to your colleagues um, or physicians. Uh, but I, I think um, it's been really impressive. The, the other thing that uh, I've reflected on with some of my friends. In fact, I was talking to um, Brian Wong in, in uh, Toronto about this. Um, it does seem as though trainees and youth and young hospitalists have rallied around this in a way that was has been even um, more robust than when you look at something like quality improvement um, or patient safety and that we really seem to be driven crazy by the things we do for no reason. And so when you talk to a trainee and you talk about trying to cut out waste, trying to cut out all those unnecessary tests and things we do, and, you know, that's, that's getting rid of checkboxes on their to-do list um, every day. And so I think their enthusiasm for taking on those programs has been um, really uh, nice to see. And, and uh, perhaps even it's easier to convince them to get engaged than it might be for a more traditional quality improvement or patient safety project. Absolutely. Um, we've got a couple of questions. The first is, uh, how are, are you intending to measure the impact and uh, patient engagement with Caring Wisely? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, so with Caring Wisely, we measured the impact across a different, uh, a couple different levels, and I, I, we hope to do the same here with uh, Bridges to Better Care, which was, um, one, obviously our key con constituent there had been the medical center. Um, they were funding it. So it was you know, cost savings that we could show for each project um, from the perspective of the medical center. But very importantly, um, we, you know, stipulated that every project could not shift costs. So it wasn't about shifting costs to the insurance or the patient. Um, it had to actually decrease utilization that would decrease cost total. Um, and so for each project that we uh, implemented, we had a single metric that we would look at and we created a dashboard across the years um, that we followed. So for blood transfusions, we looked at total number of PRBC units um, and we tracked that and we had a cost associated with that and so we could show cost savings um, quarter after quarter. Um, we did programs looking at CTPEs, and so for that we were looking at, you know, total number of CTPEs ordered in the emergency department um, quarter after quarter. Um, you know, the, the patient engagement part is one that I don't think we necessarily did well within the first few years of Caring Wisely. I, I think that there's a clear opportunity to ensure that we're really engaging patients. Now, some of the programs we did, um, such as one I led looking at nebulizer use, um, we did implement where we would survey and we were looking at patient satisfaction and seeing how they were responding to it. And um, a big piece of the program was focused on educating patients on how to use their inhalers appropriately. So it was a part of what we were doing, but I, I don't think we were capturing it as well. And I, I, I think that's something that we can um, aim to do better with Bridges to Better Care. And apologies, I uh, missed a word in that. How are you measuring the educational impact of the work that you're doing? Yeah, thank you. Um, another uh, great question. I, uh, so, for, so far for um, the, uh, 
intro to value-based healthcare, we're really right now just trying to collect um, engagement uh, numbers. So how many people have done it, which, you know, is really what uh, open source programs like IHI Open School um, have used as a, a metric of success in the past. But we're working really, we're working really hard on creating a more robust platform where we can collect real life examples and we can host actually challenges um, where we see what people have done as a response to the program where we can put forth a challenge like design a more rational hospital bill or who's created the, the um, best program uh, this year on decreasing unnecessary Foley catheters, something to that effect. Um, we want to collect that. Where we do have a robust uh, plan is with the Choosing Wisely Stars program. So at Choosing Wisely Stars, um, we're putting it through our IRB, IRB now, but um, we'll be measuring students' changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors um, in response to the program, as well as collecting uh, qualitatively what they've done at their institutions. And then we also will be measuring um, their entire class. So even though it's only two students from the class, we, we are going to have a before and after survey of their entire first year med school class and follow them over time um, to see how we're changing their, their attitudes, behaviors, um, and uh, we're using some validated instruments for that. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, when you're launching some of the, the bridge initiatives, um, I, I like this question. How do you encourage the more established physicians with the I went to medical school, not business school attitude, mm. which I, I think mm. may be a, a specific diagnosis, um, to get them on board? <laughs> yeah, great question. You know, I, I have... Um, I've never lived in the real world. You know, I was in San Francisco, and now I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, and uh, I think... You, I, so what I'm saying is that the schools that I've been engaged in, like here in Austin, many of our students actually are interested in going and get MBAs, which is an increasing trend. Um, we have leadership, like intensive leadership training that starts during their orientation. Um, so I have to say that many of my students um, have, have recognized the value in learning uh, about some of the business as aspects and leadership. Um, certainly, I, I think you said more established as a as a nice euphemism here. Um, and I, you know, I think that uh, it's frankly it's a losing battle. Look, I, I think physicians can continue to make that argument and and put our head in the sand, but it's clear that if we don't address costs. Um, somebody else is going to on our behalf. Um, and so I think really making that argument and, and spending a long time, which we've done, on the why of teaching about value um, and really understanding the perspective of why this is better for patients, why this makes you a better doctor um, is important. And to that point, I you know oftentimes say, look, I don't – they don't need to have uh, understand cost accounting essentially or know exact dollars and cents of things, but it sure seems like it makes sense to have a basic understanding about healthcare financing and how these things get paid for and whether or not your patient's going to be able to fill that medication you spent so long prescribing and getting authorization for. Um, and so I think focusing on the, the why, the motivation is really important, um, and then also recognizing um, we're not trying to give you a business degree or business school or you don't have to be an administrator, um, but we want you to understand the part that is vital to, to current um, medicine, to how we provide medical care in the current setting. Great. Well, I have one more question for you. Is there something, as you've been putting these together and, you know, going around the country telling folks about it, is there, have you gotten one or two reactions that have really surprised you throughout this process? Hmm. Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, I, gosh, let me think. I like I I feel like, and I I, I apologize. Cause I almost feel like it was a cop out. But well, the one thing that surprised me really was how uncontroversial it's become and been. Because um, like I said, this started out in over a very short period of time. Um, the the getting people to buy into the idea that you need it. Um, has not been hard. You know, the, the much harder part has been getting us to overcome some of the barriers. You know, where do you find the time? Where do you find the expertise? How do you deal with this if nobody, none of the faculty ever learned this? I mean, all those barriers, I think that that has been challenging. But my surprise has been at how it really has um, taken root over such a short period of time and how, um, the, how students and, and residents have really um, wanted to step up and, and lead. Um, I guess the 
The thing that has surprised me perhaps as a, as a major barrier, no matter where you go, um, it's incredibly, the, the barriers that data presents to doing this type of work, like our Caring Wisely work, Bridges to Better Care, um, just never, shock, never cease to shock me that we really can't get just the most basic information a lot of times, and it really hamstrings our ability to do things. And when you're looking at utilization or quality data, that's true. When you dig into cost, that becomes even more acute. You know, trying to get cost information from your hospital can be incredibly challenging. Um, and it, it shouldn't, but it never ceases to surprise me at how um, even doctors working within the system can't ask their own administrators for costs about their own care um, because it's some, you know, tightly kept secret. Um, that, that, that always uh, mystifies me. Uh, I think it's a hard question to answer with the, the way our system is set up. Well, with that, since we're nearing the top of the hour, I just want to thank you for sharing um, your thoughts with us and uh, thank everyone who's on the line for participating in today's webinar. Um, as a reminder, we'll uh, post a uh, recording of this session on our website, which is ahaphysicianforum.org. And um, you can also find the list of additional uh, upcoming webinars uh, that are scheduled throughout the rest of the year. So with that, again, thank you, Dr. Moriarty, for joining us, and uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's teleconference and webinar. You may now disconnect your phone and log off. Speakers, one moment.